In 1986, the Central Library in Los Angeles, California, burned for seven hours. 400,000 books destroyed, another 700,000 badly damaged. Firefighters were injured, arson was suspected. That's the story that might draw you into Susan Orlean's new offering, The Library Book, but they are just the beginning of what turns out to be an intricate and fascinating read. Susan Orlean is a staff writer for The New Yorker, contributor to Vogue, Esquire, and Rolling Stone, and author of several books, including, of course, The Orchid Thief, and she joins us now for more. So great to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, you would think that the destruction of the one of the biggest libraries in the world, the largest U.S. library fire ever, is a story that would have been told many times and very well over the years. Is and that the case? It is not the case, yeah. and that's a lot of what drew me to the story. I, I'm fascinated by events of this magnitude that somehow escape notice. And there was a very particular reason, as I learned right away. When I first heard about the fire, I thought, I can't understand how I wouldn't have known about this. I looked up the newspaper headlines for that day, and I, I was living in New York at the time of the fire in 1986, and the headline was something to the effect of Soviets deny meltdown at Chernobyl nuclear plant. Mm. So there was so some bigger news going on that there day. Was, Certainly another story of a disaster hmm. that became an international preoccupation for good reason. So how'd you find out about it in the first place? Complete serendipity. Hmm. I was being given a tour of the downtown branch of the library when I had first moved to Los Angeles. And we were stopped in front of the fiction section. And the man who was giving me the tour pulled a book off the shelf and took a deep whiff of the book and said, you know, you can still smell the smoke in some of them. And I thought he meant that they allowed people to smoke in the library. <laughs> I was surprised. Mm. And he said, no, no, from the fire. The fi and I said, what fire? And there he you said, go. the fire in 1986 that shut the library for seven years. The minute I heard it, I thought, I need to write a book about this. Really? You knew it was I, a book right I away? I knew immediately. <laughs> I, I was. First of all, I had been thinking a lot about libraries up until that point and thinking of what interesting institutions they are. And then here was this narrative that I wanted to know everything about and, in, and, and to know why it was such a disturbing image to picture a library burning. Mm. Why does it connect so deeply? Well, here's some of the facts and figures of what transpired on the 29th of April, 1986. Go ahead, Sheldon, bring this graphic up. The fire lasted seven hours and 38 minutes, and if you can imagine, it burned at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And we know from Ray Bradbury what temperature books burn at, Fahrenheit 451. 50 firefighters were injured. More than half the fire department in Los Angeles was on that site. 1,400 bottles of oxygen were used by the firefighters. More than three million gallons of water needed to extinguish the fire. And these bear repeating, even though we said them in the intro, 400,000 books destroyed and 700,000 books were damaged. This may seem like an obvious question, but why was the fire so difficult to put out? It's not at all an obvious question. I mean, to begin with, books are so flammable and a library essentially is filled with flammable material. But there was another reason, and that was the books were stored in stacks typical of a library, which is the where you store the books that aren't out on the shelves. The stacks were built in a traditional way that is true for many libraries. It was essentially a, a chimney. It was a seven-story high, thick-walled, small room that didn't have uh, floors between the levels. Mm. So the fire started on one level and it simply shot up to the top. To get into the stacks, you had to sort of crouch and as it was, the librarians hated the stacks because they were dark, they were hard to navigate. So the firefighters with their equipment could barely get into the stacks and the fire just got hotter and hotter. And you describe fire that was in some respects clear. It didn't look like fire. The firefighters who I interviewed said it was really frightening. It went from red to orange to blue, and then it became completely clear because it was so hot. Hmm. 
and to see through a fire, they said it was a terrifying sight. Here's an excerpt from your book, a volume of Don Quixote from 1860, illustrated by French printmaker Gustave Doré. All of the books about the Bible, Christianity and church history, all biographies of subjects H through K, all American and British plays, all theater history, all Shakespeare, 90,000 books about computers, astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, seismology, engineering, and metallurgy, all the unbound manuscripts in the science department, a book by architect Andrea Palladio from the 1500s, five and a half million American patent listings dating from 1799 with drawings and descriptions, all Canadian patent material from approximately the same period, 45,000 works of literature, authors A through L, a leaf from the 1635 Coverdale Bible, which was the first complete translation in modern English, any book accidentally shelved in the sections that burned, we will never know what they were, so we cannot know what we are missing, and that's only half the list. What is it about books burning that hits us so much more emotionally than if anything else were burning? It, it really does. Um, from the beginning of time, burning books has been used to terrify people because books feel like just an extension of the human mind. They are. They're a, a, a really a vehicle for preserving the knowledge, the fantasies, the dreams, the imagination, the stories, the narratives that are essentially human. Mm -hmm. So burning books feels like you are, it's a, a little death. It's, and that's why you have regimes starting at the very beginning of civilization through Nazi Germany and on, Cambodia, the Iraqi government, it's a way of saying to people, we are erasing you from the world's memory. And it's a horrifying thought. You actually wanted to see what really happens when a book goes up in flames. You did it. I did it. It was not easy to do, even though I knew I was doing it for a legitimate reason. I had a lot of trouble picking which book I would burn I was because- I say, which one did you pick? Well, I first thought I would burn a book I didn't like, and then I thought that seemed really wrong. I thought I'll burn a book I like, and then I thought, well, I can't do that. One day I had said to my husband, I just can't do this. I can't bring myself to burn a book. And he came home one day smiling ear to ear and handed me a copy of Fahrenheit 451 and said, I think I have your book for you. It couldn't have been more perfect. Yeah. Uh, and I think Ray Bradbury would have approved. Can you take 30 seconds just to tell us why Fahrenheit 451 is such an appropriate book for you to have burned in your experiment? It's a book about a dystopian future in which books are outlawed. And if there are fire crews who are assigned, if they find books, to burn them. So they're not a firefighting unit that puts fires out. They're a fire unit that sets things on fire, namely books. Yeah. They suspected arson from the start. How come? It was an analysis of where the firefighters believed the fire had started, which was on a bookshelf. And on a bookshelf, there's nothing like, a, there's no electricity, there's nothing that would appear to be able to start the fire accidentally. In the absence of that, the assumption is that it must have been started by someone deliberately. And because they had decided that that's where the fire began, the next thought was someone set this fire on purpose. And the guy they decided was a guy named Harry Peake. Tell us about Harry. Uh, Harry was a handsome California boy who was Charming, well-liked, um, his friends thought he was just a very lovable guy. He dreamed of being a movie star. He moved to Los Angeles after high school and with no particular plan, no experience as an actor, but a great fascination with celebrity. He was afflicted with one terrible character flaw, which was he was a, a compulsive liar. <laughs> Usually lied about harmless things, would say he had had lunch with Cher or that 
He had gone out for coffee with Burt Reynolds. He, he was always making his life more dramatic than it really was. And he began telling his friends that he had started the fire. And word of that reached the fire department and the arson investigators. And unfortunately, whether he was lying as was his habit or not, he fit the description of someone who was seen in the wrong part of the library on the day of the fire. We are going to come back to the notion of whether or not you, at the end of the day, believe he did it or not. We'll, uh, we won't give up the whole story right now. I want to take us back. Let's go back uh, to our uh, long ago past when computer screens were not fixtures in libraries and what a visit to the library might have looked like. And if you wouldn't mind, look at the monitor up there. What does that look like to oh you? Oh my God. <laughs> well, that is my childhood library. Oh my God. This is going to make me cry. Um, that is where I fell in love with libraries. That's Shaker Heights, Ohio, a suburb of Cleveland. And that's the Bertram Woods branch where I used to go with my mom all the time. And that really is why I ended up writing the book in many ways was Re, really kind of grappling with those memories and refreshing them and savoring them. How did the need for a library arise? And, and we'll get back to the library you write about now. How did the need for a library arise in Los Angeles, California, uh, almost 100 years ago? Back then, people did not have private collections of books. Um, there were not very many books in California at all. People were coming west with their, the barest of their belongings. So the idea of needing to share books was, a, a, it really was a necessity. It wasn't a, a luxury of having this beautiful library with lots of books. It was the only place you could find books. And people were in, in that particular um, era the idea of building a library of your own was something that you did only if you were very wealthy. Mm. Books were printed slowly and laboriously, and they weren't being printed out on demand and in huge quantities. So it really was a big deal to own a book. And for most people, it meant you didn't own books. You went to the library and you borrowed a book and you read it. and. I should say, if you were a man. Uh, I was because, just going to ask you about the gender politics. <laughs> this, and you had to be an adult man. Mm -hmm. Children were not allowed in the library. And women were allowed in a reading room where they could look at magazines. But they did not have library privileges. At what point was a woman working in a library considered OK? Well, believe it or not, LA had at a time when women didn't really have full rights to borrow books from libraries, LA was run by the head librarian was female. Mm. In fact, one of the very first heads of the library was an 18-year-old 18, 18 girl who was so young that her dad would walk her to work. There she is. And yes, Mary Foy, an incredible figure who held her own when all of her patrons were adult men. And there was lots of poker playing and, and shenanigans in the library that she had to oversee. Librarianship didn't really become a female profession until the 1920s or so. Up until then, really, most librarians were men. The clerks were often women, but mm -hmm. the library staff, the people who were trained librarians, were primarily mm -hmm. men, and women didn't have full privileges to use libraries for a long time. The central branch that you write about uh, was built in 1926, and over the decades, I mean, it was the jewel, and then it really fell apart. What happened to it? Starting in the mid-1960s, downtown LA sort of entered its doldrums, as did many downtowns around the world, um, and certainly in the US. At that same time, all of the money going into libraries was going into the building of branches because the city was spreading and spreading. And nobody really thought downtown mattered very much. The building was too small. And all of the kind of tedious maintenance wasn't being done. 
Then you had things like Prop 13, where suddenly there was very little money for, for government um, funding of, of anything We in should explain to, to a Canadian audience here that the uh, Proposition uh, 13 offered people an opportunity to have their property taxes cut significantly, but of course the services would be cut as well. Right, and it was voted in. So yeah. California really took a huge hit at that time, mm -hmm. and institutions like the library. So there was a move afoot to sort of say, do we even need a downtown library anyway? Why not just have these branch libraries out in the suburban areas, and we don't need the downtown branch? But there were a lot of people who rallied and said, this downtown branch is, it's the jewel of the library system. It's where all of the great collections exist. And the building is a, an architectural landmark. It really is. Um, LA at the time didn't quite appreciate architectural landmarks. So this movement, it was 20 years of argument hmm. from the early 1960s until 1986, when it was finally determined, all right, we'll, we'll save the downtown branch, we'll keep it in this building, we'll restore and renovate the building, and we'll add a branch, and the, uh, rather a wing, and then the library fire. Hmm took place. And tell us about the, the discrepancy about sprinklers, because I, I gather for decades, the idea was you didn't want sprinklers in libraries because this, the water could damage the books just as badly as the fires could. And early sprinkler systems were pretty insensitive. If you set one off, they all went off, and it was hard to turn the water off. So there was a great fear that a, a minor thing, like somebody lighting a cigarette, even though they weren't allowed to, but let's say someone would light a cigarette in the library, it would turn on the sprinkler system and the books would be destroyed. What's the verdict today on whether or not yes or no to sprinklers? Well, yeah, now the, the verdict is yes. Verdict is and yes. sprinkler systems are much more <clears throat> sophisticated now, but there was also this appreciation that you need some way to put a fire out because once a fire begins in a library, it's going to really go. Once this building really went and they had to pick up the pieces and try to uh, clean it up and then rebuild and so on, uh, there was a great outpouring uh, from the general public to help out. For example, to do what? The night of the fire, 2,000 people showed up, completely mm -hmm. unbidden, to help with this enormous task of removing 700,000 damaged books mm -hmm. to get them into storage somehow to protect them until they could be dried out and hopefully restored. 2,000 people. The next day, another 2,000 people showed up, formed a line to just pass book after book out of the building because it was an enormous task. And it really brought the people of Los Angeles together. Unfortunately, a crisis, but any idea that there isn't civic communal spirit in LA was disproved absolutely by this and and also the fact that people really loved the library. Yeah. How many of the 700,000 books that were damaged did they manage to save at the end of the day? More than half, which hmm. is remarkable and it, it took a huge amount of work but it, it was considered worthwhile because so many of those books couldn't have been replaced. It wasn't just a matter of saying, well, we'll buy a new one, because you couldn't buy a new one of a lot of those books. Mm. I know you get asked this all the time, so I'm going to ask you as well. And you do talk about it in the book. And I know you've sort of flipped and flopped on where you think the story eventually should land. But you've looked into this more than anybody alive. So we want to know, at the end of the day, you know, was it arson? Did Harry Peake do it? Did he not? Was it something else? What's, what's the best theory in your view? The best theory is that it's inconclusive. <laughs> and I know that seems it's like very I'm, unsatisfying. I know <laughs> I'm equivocating a little, but I really go back and forth. I, there was a time where I became convinced that the analysis of it being arson was inaccurate. But then Harry Peake knew an awful lot about what happened that day that it wouldn't have been possible for him to have known. The thing that remains the question to me is, why would he have done it? And all I can think of is this motivation to be noticed was so powerful for him that even though he wanted to be noticed as a star, being noticed became 
more important than the reason he was being noticed. Mm. And you couldn't interview him? Unfortunately not. Um, and he, it was a mat, he had passed away at died the of time AIDS. I worked on the book. Yeah, died yeah. of AIDS-related causes. We're going to put some pictures up right now. So again, have a look at the monitor here because um, it's gorgeous today. What are we looking at now? This is the McGuire Garden uh, leading up to the uh, main entrance of the library. And it, it, it's the, um, what you're seeing is this beautiful tower that's all mosaic on the top of the building. There you go, hmm. that's a great picture of it. Mm -hmm. The building is also covered with quotations about reading all around the building. So the architect, Bertram Goodhue, had this idea that you should be able to read the building. Hmm. And in fact, you, oh, and this is my favorite thing in the entire building, this absolutely exquisite chandelier that's in the rotunda. It's a, it weighs a ton, and it's the earth surrounded by the signs of the zodiac. During World War II, that had to be lowered to the floor of the rotunda because there was so much concern about possible bombing in Los Angeles. Only until 1944, you tell us. I guess they were feeling confident that the right. world was going then, in the right direction. Then they lifted right it direction. back up. But uh, this is part of the new wing that was added to the library. And it was done so that a lot of people don't even realize that it's a new addition. It, it's very subtle. Hmm. Let me raise, um, well, let me read this, and then I'm going to raise a bit of an uncomfortable question here. The publicness of the public library, you tell us, is an increasingly rare commodity. It becomes harder all the time to think of places that welcome everyone and don't charge any money for that warm embrace. The commitment to inclusion is so powerful that many decisions about the library hinge on whether or not a particular choice would cause a subset of the public to feel uninvited. This raises a bunch of questions about whether libraries primarily are for people to go, to look at books, to read, to study, to do whatever they do, or whether, as has happened all over the world, it's turned into a place where homeless people hang out because they feel safe, they feel well cared for, uh, and it's, you know, it's shelter. Right. What do you, how, how do we resolve that conundrum? Well, it's a huge issue, and I think the, um, the sort of utopian version of this is that society doesn't leave it to libraries to provide a safe shelter for homeless people, but rather that society steps up and says, we need to find a way to provide a comfortable place for homeless people, and better yet, to find homes for homeless people. The library has de facto begun providing services that, that's not what people learn in library school. Hmm. On the other hand, the commitment is there to say, we, if you behave, if you meet the code of conduct that has expectations that are reasonable, you should be allowed to come to the library. And as a result, you get lots of people who aren't able to go sit in a Starbucks because they're not going to be buying a cup of coffee mm -hmm. or at some point they'll be kicked out. I think the issue is a societal issue. It's not a library issue. And libraries have done a really pretty heroic job expanding their purview to provide social services, to try their best to deal with this population in the library. And I think that all of us um, want there to be a balance in the library. It, it shouldn't be all homeless people either. Mm. It should be really representing mm. society as a, a broad spectrum. But we have choices to go all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. And we may say, well, I don't want to go to the library. There are too many homeless people there. I think the, the better choice is to make the opposite decision and say, Let's all patronize the library and help help it be a vital place for everyone. We got a minute left here, which is long enough for me to ask you, who is Austin Gillespie? <laughs> that is my son. I know it's your son. <laughs> and I want to show everybody here, which camera is going to show this? Look how, um, look how sneaky the author is here. 
Okay, everybody who used to go to the library back in the day will recognize this card, right? That was the card where you had your due date slip put in there. And look whose name she has snuck <laughs> onto that. And you got your own name there. And then there's Austin Gillespie's name. And why that date? September 10th, 2010, is that significant? Uh, well, that's roughly the date that I took him to the library and kind of had this Proustian moment of thinking, oh my God, I want to write a book about libraries. <laughs> and I see you got Ray Bradbury on there too. Yes, and then there's one other very important there's person Edith there. Gross, who's that's that? That's my mom. Ah, that's your mom. Yeah. That's very clever, Susan. You managed to figure out a way to sneak them all in there. <laughs> right. It's a little coded, but it, it's um, it, very meaningful to me because really the book was so much connected to my mom. And in a way, I hope it's also really connected to the future. And, and my son represented that to me. As soon as I saw that, I said, there's a story there somewhere. I'm going to find out about that. <laughs> this is not only a, a fantastic read. I mean, really, how many Canadians ought to care about what happened in Los Angeles 30 years ago? But you make us care, because the library book is, and it's a beautiful looking book as well. So thanks for writing it, and we really appreciate you coming in and trying Thank you for so us much. tonight. Thank you so much. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.